Sometimes a band thinks they need a manager when maybe they need a booking agent. It, it's different for different artists. If a major label says, no, we're not feeling this, you're not going to then be like, oh, but but we just wrote a new song. Here's, you know, you're going to, you're going to wait a little while and show growth and maturity and all that. And it's the same with looking for management. Just try to really have as much developed as you can. I mean, if you're able to build up a streaming numbers, develop an audience in your hometown, airplay on your college radio station, these are all things that are going to make you more compelling too, whether it's a manager, a working agent, a label and turn any of it, right? Whatever you can bring to the table, it's showing that there's an audience for you, it's showing somewhat of an understanding of this business, that you're willing to do the work. It's going to give you more options. The more you can build up as an artist, the more interesting you're going to be, more enticing you're going to be for anyone to, to hop on board. What's going on? Welcome to the New Music Business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book third edition coming out very soon, later this year. Look out for that. Today, my guest is Jordan Curland. He is the founding partner and a manager at Brilliant Corners artist management company. He manages uh, Death Cab for Cutie. He's been managing them for a couple decades at this point. One of my favorites, and don't mind me while I geek out with him a little bit uh, during the episode, during our conversation about Death Cab. Uh, they have two of my favorite records of all time, Transatlanticism and Plans. We get into that. Uh, he also manages on a, a new artist side, Toro y Moi. And on the roster uh, at Brilliant Corners, they have Soccer Mommy, they have Best Coast, they have New Pornographers, The Dip, Pup, Josh Ritter, Charlie Hickey, just to name a few. We get into all things artist management. So if you are interested in what artist managers do, uh, how to get a manager, if you yourself are interested in being an artist manager, uh, we have one of the experts in the field, or if you yourself are interested in being an artist manager, this is the episode for you. We have one of the experts in the space, and he continues to prove himself time and time again with all of his artists starting um, 20 some years ago till current day. And they have a very, he has a very interesting philosophy when it comes to artist management and also where we're at in this day and age and the kinds of artists that he is looking to develop. Little hint, it has nothing to do with TikTok which I'm sure is going to be refreshing for you when you listen to this if uh, if you're not on the TikTok train and that has not been resonating as much with you. As always, please like, subscribe, follow this show. If you haven't subscribed to this, just hit pause right now, subscribe, follow. You'll get notified about all the new episodes. You can find me at Ari Herstand on Instagram and Twitter. You can find all of us that make the show happen at Ari's Take, Instagram, Twitter, and yes, TikTok, of course. Visit Ari's Take.com. Get on that email list. That is where you're going to get all the most up-to-date information about the new music business, everything we have going on, but more importantly, all the resources that we put out uh, to help. Please give us a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Just give us that review. Those really help. We really appreciate that. If you're listening to this on YouTube, Leave a comment. I'd love to hear what you think. All right, let's kick into the show. Jordan, Carlin, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate you having me. Of course. And, uh, you know, whenever there is a, an artist manager or, or entrepreneur like yourself who's been in the industry for a while that's willing to pull the curtain back and share the wisdom with um, all of the artists out there that don't really get the access or get the chance to talk to people like you very often. Um, it's uh, it's it's really great and uh, exciting to be able to, you know, just uh, hear directly from uh, the industry. And yeah. that's the thing that you know one of the, one of the reasons that um, I love doing these interviews is get to share this information. And I know that you've done a few interviews, which is great. And uh, you're one of the few managers out there that that is open to sharing and willing to kind of educate uh, the uh, artists out there and kind of what's happening in the industry. So thank you for, for being part of this. Well, yeah, of course. My pleasure. I think it's, I think it's important that, mm -hmm. you know, people like myself who have been fortunate enough to do this for a very long time, that we share, their, share our experiences and stories. You yeah. know, it's, there's way more resources now about the music industry than there was at the time I was looking to get in. Mm. Just as far as, you know, university programs and books sure. and obviously yeah. not to totally date myself, but the internet was <laughs> not really, didn't really even exist. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. the internet was being used, but, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. really enjoy it. I think it's, awesome. it's, I, I enjoy these conversations and I enjoy sharing, sharing what I know. 
Amazing. Well, thank you. And let's let's kick in. I mean, uh, where do you spend most of your time these days? Is it with uh, Brilliant Corners, artist management? Uh, yep. Is that kind of where your focus is? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, that's that's definitely my day job, so to speak. Okay. And um, you know, especially at this this period of time, it's it's so important as mm -hmm. you know for for our clients as the industry gets back to some degree of being normal yeah. and artists start to tour and records come out. I feel like mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's not only where I want my, my time to be spent, but it's where my time is most needed right now. Awesome. That's great. Um, and so tell me how Brilliant Corners is structured. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of management companies have different kinds of um ways that they function and how managers work together or don't work together or are siloed or have their own uh, client roster or everybody works together. Tell me how Brilliant Corners is set up and, and the managers that you have uh, working with you. Well, we, you know, we, we really strive to be an integrated team. Okay. And there are some management companies where there's, you know, a, a number of managers involved that's more of a collective mm -hmm. that that's not that's not how we operate like we we really i'm not gonna you know sell the idea that it's this you know amazing we're all in sync but it's we we sure. really are a team and okay. we have um you know the way we're structured is that there are managers and then there are support services that we sh that we share um we have multiple staff meetings a week with everybody okay. hmm. And we share ideas and we talk about what's going on with clients and we have, we use Basecamp to communicate with the whole team, you know, just mm -hmm. 20 minutes before I hopped on here, a manager sent a uh, note out to the team asking for merch designer suggestions for a client, mm -hmm. you know, so it could be as simple as that. It could be, mm -hmm. We might get a request to use a song from artist A in a in a spot that doesn't make sense for that artist, and so we pass it along and see if we can try to slide another another artist in there as well. So we really try to, you know, share resources, share share energy, share ideas, etc., sure. etc. You know, last and week we we had a brainstorming meeting for one. You know, the all hands brainstorming meeting for one client was a record company. Yeah. Huh. Cool. And how many uh, how many people work at Brilliant Corners? We're at, uh, ten people right now. So I mean, okay. we're we're you know we're we're a boutique management company, sure for sure. Um, uh -huh. And there's five managers at the okay. company right now. Mm -hmm. One who's still doing some day to day kind of transitioning, okay. and then we have you know then we have a. Uh, one of my partners is really acts in a GM role of the company, and then we have four support staff. And what do you mean by support staff? Day to days, assistance, that kind of stuff. Yeah, day to days, digital, etc. Um, okay. You know, things shifted a bit during COVID. We used to have a touring director mm. that we we did not need for the last couple of years. I think that that'll happen again. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we try to we hired another digital person over the last few months because that's obviously just more and more important and we have so many records coming out in the near future yeah uh so digital person i hear that term get thrown around a lot what does yeah. that mean well it depends. i mean it you know on the base level it's just making sure that you know like digital person one-on-one -on -one is making sure that socials are updated websites are updated etc um okay. You know, there's also some strategy, you know, different. We have one woman who just started a few months ago, so that's mm -hmm. kind of where she's at. Um, okay. We have another woman who's been in that role at the company for a number of years. So we rely more on her for, you know, for strategy and, um, you know, suggestions and best, you know, best practices, et cetera. Um, so, but, but it's. You know, at, at our size company, everyone does a little bit of something of everything. Okay. Right? But at the end of the day, it's you know our our digital person is you know they that's they work with the day to day manager and the manager on everything that needs to be up 
out in the world and on the artist's behalf. You know, it could also be as basic as making sure when we put a tour on sale that all the, you know, the, all the photos on venue websites are up to date and links are up to date and it's the right bio, et cetera. Mm. That's helpful. Uh, there are yeah. so many uh, show posting sites and probably making sure that the bands in town and the song kick are yeah. communicating yeah. with the venues and the ticket links are correct yeah. everywhere yeah. and all of that. Right. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So when it comes to the relationship uh, with the artists themselves, do they have a direct contact? Do they say my manager is so is is Jordan or do they say? <laughs> I'm managed by the team at Brilliant Corners and I have five managers um, and I can talk to any one of them or text them all all at once. No, I mean, it's definitely, you know, artists have a manager or, a, you know, there's there's a few of our clients that are co-managed okay. so by people within the company. But yeah, I mean, you kind of have your your manager and the manager's team. I don't, you know, whether they say I'm managed by Brilliant Corners or I'm managed by Jordan, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not... It's, it's kind of up to their discretion, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, I manage Death Cab for Cutie, mm-hmm. uh, Mac Creek in my office manages Soccer Mommy, you know, so mm-hmm. it's not, and we work together on, on stuff, but it's not, you know, I would never say I manage Soccer Mommy. You know? Gotcha. No, that, that's, um, an important, uh, clarification. Cause I think there's, um, but so, but even though you manage Death Cab and Mac manages Soccer Mommy, Y'all come together sometimes and yeah. talk about, okay, Soccer Mommy has a release coming out. We're going to yeah. brainstorm or, yeah. okay. Um, so, and and how does it work when um, bringing on new clients? Uh, mm-hmm. Is that something that the entire company decides on collectively? Or do you leave it up to each manager themselves uh, to bring in who uh, they think would be best for them. And, and you just kind of give them that autonomy. Well, it depends. So, you know, sometimes a, you know, a manager comes in and says, you know, I just heard, heard this artist. They don't have management. Mm-hmm. Um, we all talk about it. And that, you know, I, I don't, well, let me back up for a sec. So sure. we don't get in the way of, of an artist, of a manager working with an artist. Mm. We might challenge them to make sure it's what they want to do. We might play devil's advocate, but at the end of the day, if someone is really excited about an artist, Mm -hmm. really believes in that artist, they should work with that artist. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as far as the process for signing new acts, a recent example is there was one of the one of the people within the company was having a conversation with a booking agent who let them know that a, 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 a one of his clients was looking for new management. Mm. So in our next office meeting, that client, you know that that name got brought up. You know, was anyone interested? And mm. um, and. So, you know, that's one way. Another way might be simply, hey, has anyone heard this band, you know? Um, and then when we f- we figure out what the best way to go after it, you know, mm-hmm. if we get a call from an attorney and it's band X is looking for a manager and there's multiple people excited about working on it, we figure out what we think is, you know, the best combination or who has the time or, you yeah. know, who should be involved in the conversations. But cool. we all support one another, you know, when if a younger manager is going after something and it's helpful for one of the more senior managers or, you know, such as myself to, to go to a meeting or get on a zoom, we'll do it. You know, we just, Mm. you know, again, it's not like it's this utopian management company, but we just try to really be supportive and, you know, victory for, for, for any of our clients is victory for the company. Cool. That's great. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in terms of, I mean, your roster is fairly extensive, especially, um, well, it looks that way, but I guess with the five yeah. managers, I mean, and you have um, a, a very diverse roster, um, mm-hmm. everyone from Death Cab to The Dip to Best Coast yep. and Soccer Mommy. Yep. And I mean, it's just, it's it definitely spans and, and 
Toro y Moy. Uh, it's, yeah. it's spans uh, yeah. genres and and demographics and um, I'm do you is it could I guess I guess no I don't I'm not gonna guess right now yeah. but but w could someone theoretically guess uh, say all right these artists I'm assuming are managed by this one manager because like they're kind of like this and yeah. I'm assuming that the same manager that manages soccer mommy is not managing the dip am I correct that, that would that would be correct okay that would be correct. <laughs> so the same manager that manages Josh Ritter manages the dip okay. and that same manager also co-manages Toro y Moi with with me so okay um you know I think the through line with the, within the company is we we definitely manage independently minded artists that doesn't mean they're okay. artists that are all signed to an indie label i think it's more right. about an approach to how they're you know their their craft and their business okay. um hmm. you know we're drawn to career artists we're drawn to artists mm. that can make a living on the road you know not everyone ends up that we work with ends up being able to but i think sure. we have a pretty good track record record of developing that and we have mm. long-term relationships mm. um you know the reality is yeah they're different managers with different tastes. I mean, there's some managers who are more, you know, up the middle indie rock mm -hmm. managers and, you know, some who want to branch out and Darius Selka who manages the dip. He, you know, that was an artist that got brought into, you know, the company and Darius really was looking for something in that vein, you know, I wouldn't say specifically the dip, but, you know, something he wanted to said, you know, I think it'd be fun to work on, this type of artist. And as soon as one popped up, he went for it, you know? Hmm. Um, and, and it's been working really well. I mean, they're doing great. You know, uh, definitely. I actually saw them when they came through, uh, LA just pre pandemic, uh, oh, cool. played the Moroccan lounge here. Oh, um, awesome. yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a fan of a lot of the artists on your roster and I, yeah. I'm a unique case where I, I, uh, a pre, I, love death cab and i love the dip and oh, cool. uh best coast and and Tor i mean it's just kind of like you know and i think there's a lot of people that have this uh yeah. you know uh diverse taste um as well but it seems that sometimes managers can kind of specialize in a certain niche uh and mm -hmm. get to know those uh agents and those labels and just kind of that scene those festivals yeah. um whereas like you know, uh, the dip might excel at, um, uh, summer camp, for instance, uh, yeah. festival, whereas that might not be the best place for uh, a best coast or something like that. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think, you know, I've managed over the years, I've been doing this for a very long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first client I had, which I started working with him when we were both in college together in Southern California was Matt Nathanson, Matt. Ah. So I I played a few shows with Matt Nathanson actually back oh, cool. in the day. I was like, when we were, when I was, um, when we were emailing, I like, I'm like, man, I know Jordan, I know this name. I know, <laughs> I'm like, I knew of him, but I was like, I, yeah. I knew about you from Billion Corners, but I also knew like, man, like it was resonating and it was in there. I was like, yeah. wait, why do I? And then I like searched my emails. I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah. A lifetime ago, we were yeah. talking about a show or something that I did with Matt, uh, a couple oh, things. Cool. So that, that's, that's awesome. great. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, I um I managed Matt for eighteen years, you know, yeah. and, and Matt and I are still good friends. And, you know, that's the thing about management too, where, you know, sometimes relationships just time out or an artist mm -hmm. feels like they need a fresh perspective or their goals don't align with the manager or vice versa. But and I, I think part of it for Matt was he as the roster was being built in those days, I think Matt and I stopped working together in two thousand eleven. Mm -hmm. Um he, you know, he felt like he stuck out a bit, right? Because we were very yeah. indie rock centric. Sure. And um, look, I feel like I can manage anything, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, certainly you have your areas of expertise and your relationships. Sure. sure. But I think the, the, the skill or the skill set or the craft of managing, you know, whether it's a celebrity chef or a pop act, I could do it. Mm. Um, you know, am I... Am I as well equipped to manage a pop act or a big hip hop artist right now? No, because I haven't mm -hmm. gone through that, you know, mm -hmm. but so I think in answer to your question, you know, I think part of what 
drew Darius to the dip, for example, is he wanted to be challenged. You know, mm. he wanted to build up relationships differently. I think it was very exciting for us with Toro, um, you know, who we've been working with now for, I think, five or six years. Even though Toro has one foot in the indie rock world, and that's kind of came up on an indie label and it's mm -hmm. part of a part of chill wave, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been great that to branch out into more of what he's doing collaboratively and you know, more of the dance world and more of the hip hop world. And, and mm -hmm. uh, that's been fun for us. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that is also what we look for. You know, I, I, we, we get called every, it feels like anytime a legacy indie rock client is looking for a new manager, we get the call and, <laughs> And it's great. You know, it's a lot of mm -hmm. bands that I love and I feel like I can manage a lot of, you know, some of those artists in my sleep, so to speak. But I, sure. you know, part of what we do is we want the challenge and the diversity, and sure. et cetera. So. And, and legacy, are we talking like new pornographers? Is that like what you consider a uh, legacy or death cab? Is that like, where, where's the cutoff for what legacy means these days? I don't even know. I don't <laughs> is know. It 10 years? I mean, it's just 20 years, yeah, 30? I mean, just bands, that have been around, <laughs> bands that have been around sure. for a little while. That sure. Like, and, um, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with me. I mean, that's what most of our roster still is, but it's sure. just, I think because we've done well with that, mm -hmm. we, you know, we get those, we, we're, we're amongst the first to get the calls. <laughs> sure. That makes sense. Um, so let's, let's break it down a little bit more. Uh, when you say, I feel I can manage anything, um, let's just get to the core of what what artist management me artist management means to you? What what is mm -hmm. artist management? What does it mean to manage talent? I think that you know for well, that's that is a good question. It, it's um, every artist's needs are different. At the core of it, I mean, the example I would I remember when I was very early on in my career, I was explaining what I did to one of my father's friends. He said, Oh, you're like a general contractor. If you're building a house, like you're representing mm -hmm. the client, you're working with the client to help them, you know, make sure crystallize their ideas. You're going out and you're managing, making sure that the concrete's poured, the frames built, et cetera, et cetera. I think baseline, that is what we do, right? We, mm -hmm. Artists at various points in their career have different team members around them. Mm. But looking at, you know, thin artist that's, you know, quote unquote, on their way a little bit. So they're going to have a record label. They're going to have a booking mm -hmm. agent. They're going to have a business manager. They're going to mm -hmm. have an attorney. That's going to be the core team. So we work with the artist to determine, you know, what they're trying to achieve at the end of the mm -hmm. day. We make sure that the team around them is working in lockstep to try to achieve that. Mm. You know, and that's the very basic of it. And then, of course, you also have the touring team. So you've got your tour manager. And if it's a bigger artists, they're going to have a production manager, too. And we're interfacing. And, you know, we're, we're the business end of the creative entity. You know, we're the, we're the mouthpiece for the band. So, mm -hmm. so that artists can focus on creating and touring and, make sure things aren't falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. um, what we do for each artist might differ. You know, some artists want to be very involved in the day-to-day -day business. They want to be posting their own, you know, own things to Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Some artists just, we don't tend to work. There's nothing against this type of artist. We don't tend to work with artists that just want to know which leg of the pant to put on first and where to show up, you know, I mean, our, our artists, you know, tend to be more involved mm. in, in their career, which I, I love. I, lo I love for it to feel like a partnership mm. between us mm -hmm. and our clients. Um, I think, you know, as I say to, you know, clients all the time, they know their audience better than anyone because they're out yep. there playing to them every mm -hmm. night. You know, they're mm -hmm. seeing what they're wearing they're seeing what they're reacting to. And I think that's an important Part of the collaborative process for us. Mm. You know? Um, I know I'm rambling a little bit, but no, you know. it's great. And it's, it's, um, you brought up a couple interesting points. I was, I was, uh, writing these down. Um, you meant, you said you always, um, discuss with the artists what they're looking to achieve. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's a really important point that a lot of 
artists um, don't necessarily understand that uh, there isn't a one size fits all artist manager and this is how it works. But and that not everybody's uh, definition of success is the same. Mm -hmm. And so it's um, you can't necessarily say, oh, we're going to do X, Y and Z if you're not aligned with the artist, because the yep. artist might say, well, I actually wanted to do ABC and you say X, Y, Z, how do, how do we miss so much? So when you're kind of onboarding artists, um, do you have a system in place or guidance for all the managers, or is this just a general understood practice that one of the first conversations that you have is kind of the goals conversations with the artist? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's an important conversation to have. I think, you, I could be the perfect manager for one client and a terrible manager for another. Mm. You know, it just might not work in terms of communication styles, you know, uh, in, and it, it, you know, it happens. But mm -hmm. yes, being aligned is so important. And I think that's something that often isn't the case when with a manager and, a, and a, an artist and maybe not intentionally. And that's what I talk about also when, you know, relationships timing out where someone's been headed on a certain path and they want to go down a different road and mm. you feel like you're not the best person to help them get down that road or they feel like you're not, you know, or vice versa. But sure. it's so important to make sure that the goals are aligned because if I'm more ambitious than my client or vice versa, it's not a good fit. It's like any, you have to really look at it like any relationship. Mm -hmm. And if the management artist, artist manager relationship is working well, it really is the most trusted relationship, you know, and it's, it's not only about goals, it's also about re representation. Um, you know, I'm not a screamer per se. doesn't mean that I don't get frustrated, annoyed, angry, whatever, but <laughs> I'm not someone who just picks up the phone and starts screaming as the first mode of communication. <laughs> um, I don't think my, I don't think my clients want that either. Sure. So, mm -hmm. but there are some clients who do. So I okay. think, you know, it's just, it is a, so that that's part of it as well. And I, I, I say that more from, I mean, it's definitely come up on my side where people are like, well, you're not, you know, why you, they want to, they want me to get in, you know, it's happened rarely, but it's more so for mm -hmm. an artist not to go out and hire a manager who's going to not represent them the way they want to be represented. And even mm -hmm. if it's, even if what they're trying to achieve is in line with what, what they want to achieve, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you still need to be represented properly. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you mentioned earlier, um, you're building career artists, you're building, yep. um, artists who uh a lot of them most of them uh, from my knowledge um are touring artists they're ones yep. that do uh you know spend a lot of time on the road and and build up that mm -hmm. audience a, a very traditional way i don't think you have any tiktokers on <laughs> the roster not, that i could not, not, not yet <laughs> I, I i would have to i would have to download tiktok on my phone in order for that to <laughs> Oh, I mean, man. That, that is a totally viable way. I, I mean, that's all. Yep. I mean, that's the thing. It's all viable ways of finding. Sure. Things. And it's not like it's just no. We don't have any. We 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 don't have any TikTok superstars yet. Yeah. Well, that's and and you know, in this day and age, um, where we're at right now, um, I and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this appreciate hearing that that there is an artist okay. management company out there. Uh, who's not focused on who is the hottest TikTok star of the moment, and that's yeah. only who I care about because so much of the conversation these days um, is monopolized by, um, you know, what's trending on TikTok. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just had, we just had uh, Ryan Chisholm um, from Work of mm -hmm. Art on the show. Yeah. And um, yeah, he represents Ty Veritas, who's yeah, a yeah. massive star yeah. on TikTok and blew up from TikTok and built yep. his entire, I mean, he was telling me yep. to promote one of the songs. They posted a hundred TikToks to promote one song. Ty did it himself. And I'm just like, wow. And the, yeah. But it's such a different style and promotional tactic than uh what you guys do which i think is really cool and it's 
it's refreshing to hear that there is room for both styles right now in yep. the industry. And I think a lot of artists um, these days, if they don't quite grasp TikTok or grasp um, Twitch or grasp, mm -hmm. you know, Instagram in that way, but they they are brilliant artists and they yeah. they can command a stage and they can win over everyone who's in the room and the records are incredible that there's still space for them and I think a lot of artists these days are getting discouraged when brilliant artists when yeah. all they're hearing about is TikTok or or yeah. social media you have to be a social media star so what do you kind of say to those artists who don't necessarily resonate uh, or don't don't quite grasp uh, what social media is right now, but they are brilliant artists in their own right. Well, I think I think you have to. And we're having this conversation with one of our clients right now, who's mm -hmm. going to have a record out in the not so distant future, and talking mm -hmm. about well, how do we utilize the you know, I would say newer platforms mm -hmm. that weren't as crucial last time they released a record, and to me, it's it just has to feel authentic and not be pandering, right? So all of a sudden, if, you know, they start doing TikTok dancing videos, it's not going to feel very authentic. <laughs> right, 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 right. You yeah. know, but if all of a sudden, you know, you know, but if they're TikTok, you know, they make a video of them playing, rehearsing in their studio, that's mm -hmm. authentic. You know, of course, mm -hmm. I would love for, you know, it's been cool to see, and that what by me saying like I'm not knocking TikTok on any stretch. It's just, you know, it, it's been awesome to see, you know, the mountain goats had a TikTok moment or be Beach House blow up, mm -hmm. you know, even bigger because of TikTok. Like that's so great. And don't get me wrong, animals. I mean, come yeah. on, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. I would love for, mm -hmm. I would love for, you know, every one of my clients to have a TikTok, you know. Sure. Unexpected TikTok moment. But I think when now when you're looking at, well, how do we promote a new record for an artist that's been around for a while that isn't really engaged with TikTok yet? It's, it's mm -hmm. about finding the right way to do it. And to me, mm -hmm. that right way of doing it is the most important thing is authenticity. Because mm -hmm. A, people see right through it if it's not authentic. And 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 you know, it's how do I say this? It's our artists' legacies, right? And mm. not everything they're going to do to promote their career is going to necessarily be something they're going to look back on and be like, oh, that was awesome. Or this was like, that was so such a great decision on our part or our management's part. But we just don't want to try to do our best to guide them through this process of not doing things that they're going to regret because it was a short-term, you know, it was, it was, mm. a, it was for short-term gain. Yes. And they're going to feel stupid about it down the road. So that makes um, a lot of sense. We had, uh, we had Truesdale on the show and they're, um, a three piece, um, mm -hmm. um, group out of, out of LA, three women, uh, three part harmonies. And, and they've utilized TikTok in a really interesting, great way, but, but it's always been authentic to them doing mm -hmm. what they do best in a TikTok way. And mm -hmm. they, they had mentioned also similarly that, um, you know, they want to be able to be proud of every, video that they post regardless if it ha if it goes viral or not at least they can stand behind it and i think that was uh is similar to what what you said is just like the legacy and just like what are you putting out there and, and does it make sense for the artist and is it authentic yeah yeah and so then and, and i think that's that's what we would do in any medium so i think it's you know obviously mm -hmm. there's best practices for different mediums and want to figure sure. out and learn about it and thankfully there's people who work in my office who are in their twenties, you know, so they understand, <laughs> understand it in a much deeper way than I do. Sure. Um, but that, that's, that's really it. I think any platform that helps people discover music is a positive mm. period. Mm -hmm. And then it's about us to help our artists navigate the different platforms mm. and how they want to be represented on them. Mm -hmm. or how they want to represent themselves on them. Absolutely. Um, now, when it comes to um, putting that team together, um, what are the steps that you take when you're looking at um, labels versus 
distributors with label services, you know, major labels versus indie labels versus hands-on distributors, uh, you know, like a uh, like an AWOL or a STEM or a Believe or an Ingrooves mm-hmm. or the Orchard, um, yeah. all of that in, in that bucket over here. Um, what's your philosophy when finding that kind of partner uh, for artists, especially newer artists? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good question. I think, you know, a lot of it's goal, right? You know, mm-hmm. if you're in what you're looking for, um, you know, if you're just looking to have your music distributed, you're, you should go to where it's going to, you know, it's going to be distributed, you know, you're going to be paid and they're going to take a, the, the least amount of a percentage as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, the indie versus major conversation, if you have those options, again, it really comes down to what, you know, what, what do majors do well, what do indies do well? Um, you know, the lines have been blurred a little bit, but at the, you know, still, you know, in my mind, major labels, they have more money, they have more relationships, they have more boots on the ground. You know, if you have a song that reacts or a record that reacts, they're better positioned to sell, stream, whatever as many, take advantage of that momentum. Mm -hmm. Um, They can activate in a quicker way. Um, Mm -hmm. Indies generally are more nimble and they're going to be better at building, Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be excited about the smaller victories. You know, uh, they might be, you know, use baseball analogy. They're going to be really excited about singles and doubles. Whereas, you know, Republic records is swinging for the fences. So, doesn't mean Republic isn't going to spend some money on artist development, but at a certain point, they're going to pull back if it does not seem like they're going to get hit the ball out of the park. So that's not out, you know, it's a huge generalization. I'm not knocking, I'm just this first label that came to mind, right? So, sure. so it's really, I think it comes down to, you know, what the artist's goals are and what, you know, as a manager, what we, you know, do we think those goals are realistic and what's the mm-hmm. short-term goal and then what's the long-term goal? Um, obviously a much different world, but, in 2004, when Death Cab left Barsuk for Atlantic Records, yep. it was not, you know, that was not something that would have happened two years prior, but culture shifted. And they saw, you know, they were doing better than they'd ever had done. Radio was mm-hmm. starting to play songs by Modest Mouse and Franz Ferdinand. And, mm-hmm. you know, it seemed like that the window was open to make the jump. And they mm-hmm. did it. Um so what was that deal like? Can you can you uh, discuss what the Atlantic Records deal looked like? I mean, Death Cab was very, I mean, there were indie darlings at the time. I mean, yeah. I remember, you know, seeing them on the OC back in the day, yeah. um, of course, and they had a very successful career um, up in, I mean, you know, uh, what yeah. uh, Transatlanticism was, uh, that was, and that was prior, and Plans was the first uh, Atlantic Records release, right? Yeah, correct. So, yeah, so, I mean, it was... Yeah, it was it was trans Atlanticism blew up. You know, I mean, they had mm-hmm. been. You know, for context, we started managing Death Cab in August of two thousand three. Transatlanticism came out in October of two thousand three, and wow. it's um, I'm no no way suggesting that I you know it's that I'm the reason it did. You know, I'm not. I just I they they made this amazing record. It was done. Um, we did not expect, you know, no one expected it to do what it did. I mean, I remember mm-hmm. sitting around the offices of our super records shortly after I had been hired, I think, so let's say maybe early September, and we we're all sitting around talking about what we thought the first week numbers were going to be, you know, cause the last two records had sold in the 50 to 60,000 range, which was a lot for an indie, indie rock band at that point, mm-hmm. you know, when you're thinking like pre iTunes, mm-hmm. you know, pre, you know, just no one thought, I mean, I think, you know, we ended up doubling what the highest prediction was that first week. I think we did 14 or 15,000 copies first week. And then it was, you know, everyone's mind was blown, but, Mm -hmm. um, the, there was a lot of interest in death cab around the time transatlanticism came out and we Mm -hmm. met with, we started meeting with, I mean, they'd met with major labels over the, you know, long before I, you know, they'd been a band for five years before I started managing them. I, I had been friends with them for a number of years, but they, major label meetings were, were, was not new to them. And around the time that fall when they were touring and transatlanticism was coming out, um, we were meeting with major labels. And at that point, we just, 
decided, you know what? We're not going to do it. We're not going to get the deal we want. Everything's going well in Barcelona. And as transatlanticism just kept progressing, growing, and then Modest Mouse releases float on and becomes a hit song. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it starts to be like, hey, not only were labels getting more competitive about it, meaning the band had more leverage for to get the type of deal they were looking to get if they were going to make a move, sure. but just trying to read the tea leaves of, 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 of culture, it felt like the right time to really consider making the move because mm. we had, myself and all the band members had seen, you know, in the past when, you know, artists are doing really well on an indie label, they kind of plateau on an indie label and then they try to make the move to a major it's one record too late you know mm. and we just we felt like in our minds it was the right time to make that move and um it was the right time to make the move we had the right amount of leverage to get the type of deal they wanted to get mm -hmm. and that was really that was can you, that's a broad stroke version can you discuss uh i, I any specifics around what a deal uh, like that I mean, looks like no i mean it just it was you know, it was creative control and I mean, it was a mm. big thing, obviously, and cool. making sure that, you know, was the, the, the guiding principle of that deal yeah. was that we wanted to know that if the band makes this move and it doesn't work out, that A, they're going to make a similar amount of money that they would have on Barsook, mm. continuing to sell the records they sold. And B that we can put, um, we could put mechanisms in place that would ensure that if we weren't getting, you know, basically if Atlantic, if it didn't connect in the way Atlantic wanted it to, and they weren't paying attention to the band, that we had a, we had independent marketing fund that we can go mm. and basically hire indies and keep it going. So that, oh, wow. I mean, the hope was that it would go well, and we would have a yeah. long term relationship with Atlantic Records, and here we are, year nineteen. Right. 18 of that, sorry. <laughs> wow, so that, that worked years. out. It's been 18 years. 2000, October 2004, I signed the deal. Um, Amazing. But, hmm. you know, preparing for the worst was like, sure. okay, this is either going to be a road we're traveling for a long time or this is a speed bump and we're going to go back to being on Bar Soup Records. And yeah. we just need to make sure that we don't lose any ground. You well, know? I, so. that's great. And I, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've always pointed to Death Cab over the years as kind of an example of a band who held out for just the right amount of time doing it on their own, building it themselves. And to the point, and I'm glad that I was right in my assessment of just from yeah. peripherally looking at the situation, yeah. as in um, you had the leverage at the time because yeah. of the audience you built, because of uh, the success of, of where uh, yeah. the previous records, what they had done independently, but also primarily the, the fan base and just, um, everything else, the, the groundwork that had already been laid, uh, to have some of that clout to negotiate, yeah. to turn down the label deals for trans, and then um, you know revisit that yeah. for the next one and follow up. And then you had the clout negotiating power and also the funds, uh, frankly, yeah. if, if you needed to. So that um, that's really interesting. And, and I think a nice lesson for people to remember that it's, you kind of went into that as, um, this is not make or break. This is not yeah. life or death. This is a next step. It may yeah. work, it may not, but either way, we're gonna be okay. Yeah, and that's it. It's like this, Death Cab's career is going to continue regardless of the label. Yes. And we need to do, not that we didn't have faith in Atlantic Records or any of the other labels we were talking to, but we need to put into place mechanisms so that if it's not working out the way that we're hoping it works out, we don't lose any ground. Yes. That was, that was really, that was the biggest thing, you know, and it mm -hmm. was, and, you know, thankfully it worked. I mean, more as, as you're well aware, more often than, than not, it doesn't. And, right. you know, here we are, um, you know, 18 years later, they are actually, you know, going to, we, we, it was a five record deal. Initially we extended the deal, you know, by one record mm. during the term and, you know, they're going to fulfill the term. I don't know a whole lot yeah. of artists that stay with the same label and the, and the term runs out. You know, it doesn't right. mean we'll be a leaving Atlantic after this record. I just sure. think we're all pretty proud of the fact that the relationships work for everybody for as long as it has. Did you expect that I will follow you into the dark 
was going to be was that a single uh, when you were making the record and putting that out? Did you expect it to do what it did? I mean, no one probably no. expected that. I mean, but... <laughs> I, I think we we knew it was an incredible song. Yeah. Not to throw anyone under the bus, but Atlantic Records did did want them to record a version that had instrumentation. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. You know, because the feeling was never going to, you know, it's such an amazing song, but no one's ever going to, on the radio, is going to play a song that's just you know, a guy in an acoustic guitar like that. Um, mm-hmm. So no, but I, I think once, once they started touring and we started seeing the reaction to the touring, then we thought it could happen. Mm-hmm. But I even remember talking to, a, a, I mean, he's, he's still a friend, but um, Dave Benson was the program director and he won't mind me saying this, but he was a program director at KFOG, which, is now defunct, unfortunately, but it was a very influential in AAA station yeah. in San Francisco. Benson saying, I'll never play this song on the radio. I can't play it's, you know, an acoustic song, you know, end up being, you know, eventually end up being the number one song <laughs> at AAA radio. Right. Um, yeah. So, no, I mean, I think that was just, I mean, that was part of the cultural moment they were having. I mean, it was, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. it's an incredible song, but, mm-hmm. you know, Soul Meets Body was, I mean, it's just funny looking back. I mean, to us, Soul Meets Body was the setup track. Everyone thought right. Crooked Teeth was the big single, right? So we were going to mm-hmm. lead with Soulmate's uh-huh. Body. It'll do well. Yep. And then Crooked Teeth will come along and we'll just, you know, hit it out of the park. Huh. I mean, Crooked Teeth did well, but, you know, that was the least successful of the three songs, you right. know? Um, so now, I mean, the short answer is no. I don't think anyone, yeah. I mean, we knew it was an incredible song, but did we think that was going to be the song that was played in, you know, at Walgreens? you know, when you're shopping 20 years later. (laughs) Of course, sure. I I have to say, um, I saw Death Cab at Bonnaroo in 20, when was it? 2015, 2016, something like that. Uh, One of the greatest shows of my life. I mean, it it was even like a daytime. uh, The sun hadn't even set yet. And I mean, I'm a a big fan. Um, But still, I've seen a lot of bands where I'm a big fan of them and and they disappoint. Uh, It was, I mean... It was they they put on such an incredible show. The sound was uh, so. It's just like it was it was euphoric. I mean, this just yeah. like they oh, the cool. the whole show. It was something that um, was very imp- like surprising in the sense of just like it being in that kind of setting at a festival outside, which can be kind of hit or miss yeah, um, during the day. And uh, it was, yeah, I mean, and, and I've seen them a, a few times over the years, awesome. but um, yeah, they're, they're I mean, yeah, incredible live I, and incredible records, of course. I, I was there and funny, I, <laughs> you know, bring it back to uh, Falling to the Dark. So a couple of days before the festival or day before the festival, we got, someone got in touch, it might've been his manager, but I think it was Chance, Chance the rapper's Chance the former rapper. manager. Pat the manager. Pat the manager, and, uh, right. <laughs> Pat, Pat got in touch. Um, you know, Chance wasn't playing, but I think he was just at Bonnaroo hanging out and mm-hmm. he wanted to meet the guys. And so he came to the trailer before the show and they're all just, they're all kind of, they're just, you know, shooting the show, whatever. And Chance looks at the set list. And How Will Falling into the Dark wasn't on the set list because Ben doesn't always like playing that at festivals or didn't always like playing that at festivals. And chance is like, what, you're not playing your biggest song. And you know, like, <laughs> I was like, man, like chance, could I like slip you 20 or something. You know, like you're doing my job. For me. <laughs> and, uh, right. And, and they ended up playing it at, yeah. at, uh, at Bonnaroo. And I think, I think Ben even before, before he played it, said when chance a rapper asks you to do something, you do it. And, I remember um, that. And I remember the Instagram yeah, post, yeah. uh, that I think yeah. chance posted or de- or they posted yeah. or something like yeah. that, where chance is crossing off a song and writing it yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. dark. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. That's yeah. funny. Um, yeah. I mean, and that, and then from that, you know, we started that, that conversation about the collaboration, which ended up being on chance's last, last record. Right. Uh, for, do you, do you remember? So it's uh, right. all kind of came full circle. That's cool. Um, I, I want to fast forward a bit. Uh, you know, I, I could fanboy out all day on, on Death Cab with you. Uh, you know, it's it's they're they're a, a great example of a career band and a band that um, makes great records and and brings it live. Um, and in and had a massive hit, um, yeah. but 
is not one of the bands that lives by the hit, dies by the hit. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I Will Follow You in the Dark, such a huge hit. Like, you can't really expect to have another hit that size at that yeah. level again. But for them, they, they, again, laid that foundation prior to that record where they get that hit. They, they find a, a, brand, a whole new audience, but they have lifelong fans. And have you carried that philosophy and what you've seen and how they've built it and when you're discussing with new artists and maybe they're they're very ambitious and they're saying you know what i want i want to be on the grammy stage i i want yeah. you know i want hits i want do yep. you do you immediately go like well let me start knocking on major label doors because that's how we're going to make yeah. it happen or or what's the approach there i think the approach i mean with the younger artist yeah, I mean, it. it's so, it really depends where the artist is at, you okay. know, I'm not, I'm not trying to punt it, but it's just with a brand new artist. Yeah, I mean, if there's songs that, like, I don't pretend that I have golden ears or whatever, but, it, you know, sure. if there's songs that I feel like this can maybe connect in a much bigger way, I would start with getting in touch with, you know, my closer friends who are in a high level A and R role with a label and get their mm -hmm. feedback on it. Because the once you go out and you shop quote unquote shop something, you can't like turn around and shop it again a month later. Right. So you right. you know, there there's a timing to it. So you want to make sure you know, obviously we communicate this to the to the client or the potential client. So you just want to make sure you're putting the best foot forward. Right. Sure. And I mean, I was having this conversation, just not someone I'm interested in managing, but a, this young, incredible guitar player, prodigy high school kid in San Francisco that, um, and was just talking to him about his process and timing. And of course, every artist is impatient, you know, right. and they want right. things to happen now, but you really just want to make sure you're in the best position possible. So mm -hmm. I think if it's a young artist, it's like, I want to be all over the radio, whatever the radio means in these days. And I want to, <laughs> when... I want to win a Grammy award and I want this, you know, then you have to really value it. Like, are they in that position right now that we want to go out and try to get Interscope records to make an offer? Do we need to develop the songwriting? Do we need to develop, not we develop, do they need, do we need in partnership, help them develop the songwriting? Do we need to help them develop a tour ba fan base? I mean, you talk about like, you know, going back to the TikTok thing, mm -hmm. like I'm more interested and this is because I'm old, but I'm more interested in a band that's selling a thousand tickets in their hometown mm -hmm. than I am in, you know, a viral TikTok moment. But maybe mm -hmm. I'm an idiot, but that's just to me, it shows like, like the dips an example, like yes. the time Darius started working with them, those guys were selling tickets, you know, they were selling out the show box in Seattle, you know, so you know, mm -hmm. something is going on there. Mm -hmm. um, people are buying into it. People are spending their money on it. And that's where I think it doesn't cost you anything but a little bit of time to watch a TikTok video or to stream a song. But if someone's right. actually, especially in this day and age when so people are used to getting music for next to nothing, you know, if someone's actually investing their, their, their dollars and spending an hour or two hours at a show, that to me is, that to me is more interesting mm -hmm. but anyway i digress so but as far as you know band yeah i mean you gotta this goes back to the conversation we're hearing like we would have to value if their band's goal is to become as big as possible as quickly as possible are we the ones that can help them achieve that do we feel mm -hmm. like they're there are we mm -hmm. setting our su su ourselves up for failure mm -hmm. by by getting involved when we don't actually feel like this is an achievable goal right you know? Right. So what is, that's, um, that's great. And, and, um, how do you approach release strategy when it comes to working with a label, whether it's indie or major, uh, mm -hmm. and the artist, where, what is your role in the process mm -hmm. and what's the label's role? I, I mean, we look at it as a collaboration, okay. you know, and I know I'm, I'm sorry if I'm being redundant about you know, keep saying, well, you know, it's different situationally for artists and label. Different labels have different strengths and weaknesses, just like different managers have different strengths, different strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Artists want to be involved in some things, not others. 
Um, so it really depends. We have to adapt, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the way that we staff our office, I mean, you know, the size we are, a lot of it is geared towards what we can, tr- can control on behalf of the artist and what we feel like we're going to augment any label, any shape or size label we're working with. Mm-hmm. But, you know, our role is, you know, to you know, working with the label collaboratively. I mean, it's like I said earlier in the general contractor, it's making sure stuff's getting done in a timely manner. Like, mm-hmm. you know, labels are really busy. We're really busy, you know, but like, Hey, let's get some video, you know, how's it going with the video treatments? Are we having any luck with, you know, what's, you know, it seems like our independent publicist we hired isn't doing the best job. We've already talked to him or her about this. You guys should check in too. You know, so it's just, you know, there's mm-hmm. a, you know, just checking in, making sure things are done. You know, oftentimes it helps the other way. The label comes out and say, hey, you know, we sent you these video director ideas two weeks ago and the artist hasn't weighed in, hmm. you know, so then it's getting that the artist to focus on it. Um, sure. So, but, you know, like a recent example is the new Tory Law record, which is out in the end of the month. It's out April yeah. 29th. Um, you know, Chaz i.e. Toro, mm-hmm. Imoa, um, he really, he's very, like, his the marketing is lockstep with the record. Like, for him, when he delivers a record, he already has a marketing vision for it. Mm. And he loves the visual effects of it. And he loves getting, he's a graphic designer and he's a painter, so he gets really gets in there yes. on that stuff. So he's able to hand, you know, a bunch of assets. Mm-hmm. In. I mean, you know, there's conversations. It's not like he just goes and rogue and does these things, but like there's mm-hmm. conversations. He's able to deliver these things. And then it becomes our job as a company and the label, in this case, it's Dead Oceans, figure Dead out Oceans. the best way to utilize those assets. Meaning, are we trying to find a premier partner? When's the best time to do it? We've got all these different assets. How do we lay it over, out over the course of a period of time? Um, you know, you look at, okay, week of release, you're going to have a bunch of earned media. So maybe it's not the best time to release this piece. Maybe wait two weeks after the release of the record when it comes, you know, so mm. we, 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 we craft that with Dead Oceans and then we have the conversation with Chaz mm-hmm. or, or we have a conversation with Chaz beforehand to figure out if he feels strongly about anything. And if not, sometimes we'll say, it's up to you all figure out what you think works best. And sometimes we'll say, no, I, I'm really feeling like this is who I, I would ideally want this to be premiered with type thing so and and by premiere you mean uh like an outlet are they still doing premieres these days is it like a an outlet well, i mean it's not that? as much but like it might be like can we get you know you might say if it's something that's a lot off the beaten path and yeah i mean premier, premieres do exist if you bring something mm-hmm. to let's say youtube and they're really interested in it and they get to be the one you know it appears there first and they give you some real estate that's, that's a premiere Gotcha. I mean, like the premiere of like, sense. oh, we're getting Pitchfork and premiere. Yeah, that still happens. But as we all know, like when you're going to a blog or music site, like what's, you know, you're going to be like top of the page at 10 a.m. and bottom of the page at 1.30. Like it right. isn't really worth it. So right. um, for Chaz, it's more partnerships, right? Like this okay. is a cool, you know, like created this film. Who's the right partner for this film or this mm. asset? That makes sense. And sometimes... He would have an idea. Sometimes we have an idea. Sometimes the label has an idea. But we spend a lot of time talking about it, you know, mm-hmm. with, with with the label and and how things fit in the overall scheme of the rollout of the record as well. When it comes to a label like Dead Oceans and Indie, um, mm-hmm. and you're working a release plan, um, are they still covering? Um, the bulk of, uh, I guess, where does that that delineation happen in terms of the marketing spend, the PR, uh, the the music video, um, all of that, the the playlist pitching. I mean, the you know the so the yeah well, they, ads, yeah. all of that. Well, it, if they, I mean, the you know record label tradition, record labels can pay for most of that. I think you know in the case of you know some artists, um, you know, I mean, there's certainly whether it's Dead Oceans or even on a major label, sometimes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> this is not the case on um, the current campaign, but you know, sometimes the label's like, look, we want to keep press in house. And if you want to go out house, you have to spend your own money doing it. You're making enough sure. money on the road. You know, um, you could spend your own money. Um, mm-hmm. In the case of like the Toro record, I mean, Chaz definitely throws a little bit of his own money to, 
generally into the video budgets because they're more ambitious than what you know the 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 label wants to pay um you know and it's really up to the artist to -hmm. decide i mean um you know label like dead oceans it's a net profit split so it's a different manner of getting paid than a more traditional record deal Um, and by net profit split you're meaning uh, like no no ownership of the masters like uh just uh, well well, so royalties or yeah well so regardless of the ownership of the masters just the idea of a net profit split is that you know after all the you know money is spent the every both entities stand behind all the money spent meaning if record label spends a hundred thousand dollars marketing a record Mm -hmm. first hundred thousand dollars recoups that no one sees any money at at one hundred thousand and one dollars you know there's a split between the artist and the label right whereas a more traditional royalty deal the artist is getting a lower percentage you know maybe more 18 percent, 20 percent, maybe 25 if you, you know mm-hmm. but you're not standing behind everything right so mm-hmm. you're some costs are 100 percent recoupable some costs are not recoupable some costs so it's just a different mm-hmm. it's a different it's a different calculation and i'm not saying one is better than the other it really mm-hmm. depends on so many factors but um you know so it's but you know many many any labels are net profit split and so you really do look at it like okay we can spend this we can the label doesn't want to spend this money we could probably i don't want to say force them but we could probably convince them to spend that money but keep in mind that's also 50 percent or 40 percent or 60 percent of the artist's money actually if we make our money back right so, right right um yeah that may that makes sense I, I think so on like a traditional major label deal where the the label is keeping 82 yeah. percent and the artist is keeping 18 percent if they get a hundred thousand dollar advance it's uh yeah. they actually of the 18 percent they have to recoup yeah. that hundred thousand not like the scenario yeah. you were saying where the first hundred thousand that comes in yeah and then hundred thousand and one the split yeah. starts to happen yeah. so it seems like <laughs> the net profit is far more favorable to the artist than having to recoup 18 yeah. percent make it make a hundred thousand dollars back within just that tiny little 18 percent and we we know all the yeah. trickery of the la- major label accounting yeah. over the years and and why most artists never recoup uh that i mean things hopefully it seems are, are changing a little bit but yeah yeah but you know the flip side is and you know in a major like if you're in a net profit split and you've got you hire an independent publicist you know half that cost you know that cost is recoupable if you're in a major label that cost isn't you know again depends on your deal but generally that is a non-recoupable cost mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you are correct like if you just look at it as like do i want 50 percent or eight you know the, the, you know it's just right. that you're re- you're standing behind a lot more when you're on when you're in a net profit split sure right if that makes sense so it's just that makes sense so, are you yeah. seeing is it still uh, are you seeing most indie uh label deals these days are they uh, kind of a 50 50 net profit is that still kind of what is yeah fairly I mean, I think more, up, there? more often than not um okay. you know some labels still prefer to do a more traditional structure for okay. it but you know i think i think most of the deals we're seeing is a net profit split for, for like a true indie you know not, true indie. i wouldn't say you know this isn't an, a knock on concord records but they're not you know like there's different levels of you know there's different types of indie labels there's mm-hmm. you know indie labels that are indie labels by virtue of the fact that they're independently owned they're not owned by you know uh universal sony and warner but right. you know they've also raised hundreds of millions of dollars in funding right so you know it's, a, it's different right and concord uh, they technically under universal or they just use universal for they use distribution? universal distribution but That's they're technically right. still an independent label still okay i got gotcha. you yeah. um right on and and um and then on the major side are you what are you seeing these days are you still seeing the 360 deals like we were seeing eight years ago or has it moved back into the traditional model or are you seeing more competitive deals because the indies and the distributors out there they have to compete with them as well 
Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing a little of all of it. I, you know, okay. I feel like majors are more open to less traditional deals than they've been because they have to at this point. And you're seeing sure. things, you're seeing things like singles deals, and you're seeing, um, you know, uh, things of you know where or EP deals or you know, there, there's definitely more mm. creativity involved, mm. you know, because there has to be, you know, yeah. just in terms of how artists release music and also how. Um, and yeah, to be more competitive with labels that are more nimble. But, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, cool. like it, you know, again, this isn't a knock on an major label, but like they're going to try to make money wherever they can. So if they can get away with right. getting a three sixty <laughs> deal and you know pay a twelve percent royalty, they're going to do that. So, yeah, um, right on. But, yeah, yeah, and um, so when it comes to kind of uh, back to the beginning of kind of where we started the conversation when. Um, you're kind of discussing bringing new artists um, onto the roster. Uh, is there something consistent across the board that's a brilliant corners philosophy or that is something that um, all of the managers uh, share collectively uh, an understanding of this is the kind of artist we're looking for, the kind of career we're looking to develop, or is it still kind of based on the individual manager if it makes sense for them and then um what is what do you what's the kind of advice that you give to artists who are uh seeking management as a two-part question but um yeah, yeah. let's start with the but first one i think with you know the brilliant like what type of artist i mean we we have a no asshole policy right so you have a no i'm sorry what was that no asshole policy no asshole um, policy all right yeah, great so, that's that's a good philosophy to know, live by an artist could be non-asshole <laughs> at age 21 and becoming, you know, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I just feel like life's too short, you know, yes. and, Great. you know, obviously if a huge artist is looking for management and they are known to be difficult to manage, you have a decision to make. But in general, I think we really want to work with artists that, um, you're not saying like we value lifestyle over work. It's just, I think for us, there's a lot of artists out there and we want to work with ones that we're going to have a good relationship with. Not, not every, you don't need to be like best friends with all of our clients. That's not it. Right. But we just want to be able to want it to be a respectful work environment for everybody. Mm. That isn't to mean that some of our clients who are wonderful people don't get frustrated or don't get angry because that happens too. But just in general, um, you know, we all know, you know, there's, there are many, many musicians whose reputations leak out far beyond the industry and into the public sphere. Um, <laughs> sure. No, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the, the people who work at the company, we all have a pretty, like, we don't have exact music tastes. We all have pretty similar tastes, though. You know, we, mm -hmm. we're kind of drawn to working with this, this company for a reason. Yes. Um, you know, if someone, you know, if, if a manager walked into my office, if let's say Joe, who's one of my partners, and we co manage some stuff together, et cetera. If you walked in my office tomorrow, I was like, hey, it's, it's a TikTok viral star that we want to, I want to work with. Like we would talk about it. If he really felt compelled to do it, sure. I'm not going to, mm. I'm not going to get in the way of that. Sure. Um, but so, I, you know, I guess what it comes down to is I, I trust the people, you know, I trust the people that you know, we that are in the company to make the best decisions in that regard. I think we all have, I think we all have pretty good taste and, um, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. shoot, I forgot the second part of the second question, question is, um, what's your advice to artists who are currently seeking management and, uh, how, what do you recommend and how do they go about approaching finding the right partner for them? Um, that goes into what they're trying to achieve mm. and goals. Like sometimes a band thinks they need a manager, but maybe they need a booking agent. Not saying that it's easier to get a booking agent than a manager, but it just, you know, sometimes they're like, I just want to tour all the time. It's mm -hmm. like, well, you know, unfortunately we're not going to, you know, we might not be super helpful in that regard unless we can find you an agent. So okay. maybe if that's what you're really aiming to do, go out and find an agent, develop your audience. Mm. And then, um, but um, it, it's different for different artists. I think, you know, in the same way that I said earlier about shopping to a major label, like if a major label says, no, you're not, you know, like we're not feeling this, you're not going to, then be like, 
oh, but but we just wrote a new song. Here's you know you're gonna have to, you're gonna wait a little while and show growth and maturity and all that. And it's the same with looking for management. And point, sure. You know, um, just you know to me, it's make sure you're you know obviously we're not our in life and that we're not all like the most self-aware about when we're ready for something or not ready for something, whether you're an artist or just a general human being, but just try to really have as much developed as you can. I mean, if you're able to build up, you know, streaming numbers, if you're able to, um, you know, develop an audience in your hometown, if you're able to, you know, if, you know, you're getting a little bit of, you know, airplay on your college radio station or <clears throat> whatnot, Mm-hmm. These are all things that are going to make you more compelling mm. to whether it's a manager, a working agent, a label, and turn any of it right. Like whatever you can bring to the table, you're going to be, you're going to have. It, it's showing that there's an audience for you, right? Mm-hmm. It's showing that there's an audience for you. It's showing that you have an, a, a, at least you know somewhat of an understanding of this business that you're willing to do the work. It just shows a lot of different things, mm. and it's going to be able to. It's going to. Um, it's going to give you more options. Mm. Yeah, you know that's. But I say that if like you're going out to try to talk to a, you know, maybe a more established manager or label or whatever. I mean, like you know, some friendagers. That's what we call you know yep. the friend manager. Yeah, can grow into real managers with that band. I mean, I like mm-hmm. to think that that's what happened with with Matt Nathanson and I. You know, I yeah. didn't know what I was doing. I had been interning at a couple of record labels in a management company, and <laughs> Matt had put out a CD at a, as a sophomore at Pitzer College, and we started working together. You know, so it's mm-hmm. like, um, so yeah. I mean, you can also find that young person or a friend that's really has a head on their shoulders and really mm-hmm. grows. I mean, you know, John Palusco was a student at Amherst, and he saw fish and started managing them. You know, it's like you just uh-huh. there's a lot of different ways to do it, but mm-hmm. I think the more you can build up. Not, I think. I know. The more you can build up as an artist, yes, the more interesting you're going to be. For mm-hmm. you know, more enticing you're going to be for anyone to to hop on board. That's great, and that's great advice, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, Jordan, this has been so helpful, and and it's uh, I mean, so many gems and and uh, really great. Um, Great things to think about, I think, for every artist out there, um, and the the young managers kind of getting started yeah. and 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 uh, how to approach that. Uh, I have one final question that I ask everyone who comes yeah. on the show: uh, What does it mean to you to make it in the new music business? What it I, can I can I answer that two ways: one meaning for me, and one yes. meaning in general. Absolutely. I think for me, I feel so fortunate and oftentimes amazed that I'm still doing this, hmm. and that not because I don't think I'm you know, I've, I've worked hard on Telltale, but like, it's really just amazing to be almost 50 years old and be able to still work around my favorite thing, which is music. Right. So yeah. that's for me. I think for someone coming into the business, you know, everyone gets to define what it means to make it. But I think if you can support yourself working in the music industry, whether you're an artist, a producer, an engineer, uh, a manager, or, but you know, you've made it like, that's yeah. it. That's the first step to making it. Right. I mean, and I, and I truly, I truly, feel that way and i think Mm -hmm. you know the new music business it's challenging and exciting it's frustrating and it's all of it but i think there's just so much there's so much great opportunity for young people to come in and help set the course for what this business is going to be going forward Mm -hmm. more more so than there was when i got into it for sure nice jordan curlin thank you so much this is great great thank you for having me appreciate it